Hello, it's Scott Manley here. and Welcome to the third part of my series on the history of communication satellites. Now, we'd reached about 1963, where the Telstar satellite had become a household name. But these early satellites had problems. Their orbits meant that they were only usable as satellites for a short period of time each day when they were sufficiently high above the horizon on both sides of the Atlantic. And that's because the satellites were on low orbits. Now, the engineers knew the solution to this because, of course, Arthur C. Clarke had laid it out decades earlier. The geostationary orbit, an orbit which goes around the world in the same time that the Earth takes to rotate. The magic distance being 42,000 164 kilometers from the center of the Earth. A satellite in this orbit wouldn't rise and set. There's a few reasons that they of course had started with the lower orbits for Telstar and Relay and they're mostly about power. Firstly, the rockets of the time weren't sufficiently capable, which might surprise you given that NASA had already been throwing probes at the Moon and all the way to Venus, but it's not just a case of sending the payload out to the target altitude, but then circularizing the orbit at that altitude, and that needs to be carried out about five hours after the initial launch. Furthermore, they need to be able to fine-tune the orbit, which requires small thrusters on the spacecraft, adding complexity. Without this, the satellite will drift around the orbit. Finally, because the satellite is much further out, you need more powerful transmitters and receivers. So the first attempt at a geostationary communication satellite was SYNCOM, Synchronous Communications. It was developed by Hughes Aerospace. Now, originally the engineers at Hughes, led by uh, Harold Rosen, had some trouble getting management interested in their project. During the 1961 Paris Air Show, they took a prototype of the satellite to the top of the Eiffel Tower to demonstrate how the relay capabilities might work. And at the time, some joked that this was about as far off the ground that the project would ever get. Like Telstar, Syncom was designed to be launched on NASA's Delta rocket, but unlike Telstar, Syncom would have to incorporate a fourth stage to circularize the orbit. By 1963, they'd upgraded to the Delta B with a more powerful second stage, so that helped them a little. So overall, Syncom at launch massed about 68 kilograms. That's slightly less than a Telstar satellite, and that included the mass of the fourth stage rocket motor, which was about 29 kilograms. Uh, that was basically placed in the center of the satellite itself. The design was another spin-stabilized uh, satellite. It was a short cylinder with a solid rocket motor in the center, solar cells around the outside feeding uh, nickel-cadmium batteries. There was a single coaxial slotted array antenna extended along the rotation axis. And uh, the fine control propulsion system had two versions. They used hydrogen peroxide uh, as a like powerful system and a fine control system was available that used pressurized nitrogen gas. Now to simplify control, the satellite was mounted on the third stage upside down, which looks very weird. It was because the third stage of the Delta was also a spin stabilized rocket motor. And by having the satellite motor point in the opposite direction to the third stage motor, it was naturally aligned so that after the third stage had fired and boosted it into the higher orbit, by the time it got to the other side, the rocket motor in the fourth stage was pointing in the correct direction. So anyway, SYNCOM-1 was launched on February 13th, 1963, and the launch went great right up to the point where the Apogee motor lit to put the spacecraft into geostationary orbit. At that moment, contact was lost and it was never recovered. It's generally believed that a nitrogen tank failed during the insertion, crippling the spacecraft. A telescope's since found the dead spacecraft in the correct orbit. So they had another go in July of 1963, and this succeeded in reaching the target orbit with a period of 24 hours. Actually, it's more like 23 hours and 56 minutes because the orbit has to actually match the rotation of the Earth with respect to the stars rather than with respect to the sun. But look, they didn't have the ability to remove the inclination. So while the orbital period was right, the inclination of the orbit was about 30 degrees to the equator, which meant that while it would remain roughly near the chosen longitude, it would oscillate or librate north and south over the course of a day, tracing out a pattern that looks a bit like a figure eight in the sky. This meant that the antenna on the ground still needed to move to track the satellite, just not as fast as the hardware that would track Telstar. 
But anyway, before any of that could happen, they had to correct the orientation. Unlike Telstar, the antenna system wasn't designed to broadcast in all directions. The single antenna had a pancake-like pattern uh, with the best sensitivity perpendicular to it, like in the direction of the solar cell. So they needed to rotate the spinning satellite 90 degrees so that the antenna was now perpendicular to the plane of the satellite's orbit. And then they would need to fine tune the orbit. And so the two propulsion systems each had a pair of thrusters one for rotation and one for translation. And the control system had to be very clever because it had to time the pulsing of these thrusters to the rotation of the satellite. The hydrogen peroxide was supposed to provide the high performance, your big burns, and then the nitrogen would be used for fine tuning things. Anyway, over the weeks following the launch, they slowly moved the spacecraft to its parking spot, 55 degrees west over the Atlantic. And the first public demonstration of the satellite's capabilities was on August 23rd, a month after launch, when a satellite call was relayed between uh, JFK in the US and the Prime Minister of Nigeria. The first satellite call between heads of state, by the way. I think that what we are doing today shows what can be done through the peaceful use of space. We congratulate you very heartily, Mr. President, for this very big achievement. Why Nigeria? Well, they needed a ground control station during the critically important orbital boost, right? And that meant a very large antenna on the surface to support this mission. They had a ship which was called the Kingsport, and it was a tracking ship. It was it started out as a Liberty ship, and then they uh, converted it to this task. So this had all the antennas and the support hardware that was necessary for the mission, and it had to be in the place where the insertion burn to geostationary orbit happened. And that would be roughly where off the coast of Africa near to Nigeria. So they basically operated out of a port in Nigeria, which meant that when the first transatlantic calls were made, they were relaying them to that ship. And of course, uh, Nigeria was the place where they were relaying them to. So yeah, the satellite operated in the same way as Telstar. It would uh, receive a signal on one frequency, 7,363 7, megahertz, and then they would shift the signal to another frequency, 1,815 megahertz, and then retransmit it after amplification. And that made it agnostic to the data types. It just had a limited bandwidth to send the data across. So it was about half the mass of Telstar, and it was transmitting from further out, and so they didn't have as much power to work with. They benefited a little from having a narrower antenna pattern, but overall it was less capable than Telstar. It couldn't carry as many phone calls. I think it could, they used it for one phone channel or 16 teletype machines. And they made a bunch of other demonstrations to uh, you know, show their, its capabilities. They even managed to transmit low quality video through the five megahertz bandwidth that was available. The picture was described by Bell Lab engineers as being of motel quality. So it would be Syncom 3 that finally delivered proper television from geostationary orbit. So yes, yeah, Syncom 3, it was launched in August of 1964 and it had a number of important changes. Firstly, the transmission system supported a wider bandwidth to allow TV to be relayed. Uh, the nitrogen propulsion system was replaced with a second hydrogen peroxide one. And the solid motor ignition system no longer worked on a timer. Instead, it relied on signals from the ground commanding it. And that was important because it needed to perform some extra maneuvers. The goal was to deliver Syncom 3 to a proper geostationary orbit, which meant that they needed a bigger booster. And they got it through the Delta D, also known as the Thrust Augmented Delta. They had added three solid rocket motors to the first stage, and the third stage was a bit bigger as well. So the third stage, when it was ready, it would be oriented so that when it crossed the equator, it would not only boost the satellite into the transfer orbit, but it would also zero out the orbital inclination. And then as the spacecraft coasted towards Apogee, the ground station would send commands to fire the thrusters and correct the spin orientation for the orbital insertion burn. However, after the third stage separated, the data that they were collecting showed that the satellite orientation wasn't right. At some point after separation, it had been knocked about 14 degrees off axis. So they had to recompute the circuit, the uh, orientation changes before they could make the circularization burn. 
So they cancelled the circularization burn on the first cycle, they corrected the orientation on the second apogee, and on the third apogee pass, they fired the rocket motor, and SYNCOM 3 became the first proper geostationary, rather than geosynchronous, satellite. So over subsequent weeks, SYNCOM 3 would then be manoeuvred to a parking spot over the Pacific, just in time for it to relay television coverage from the Olympic Games in Tokyo. The opening ceremony was actually carried live, but most of the content was edited in Japan and then relayed to the US for recording and then replay during prime time in the US. In some cases, they also relayed uh, television across the Atlantic to Europe using the relay satellite. So eventually both satellites, SYNCOM 2 and 3, would be transferred to the US military because the US military needed them and because commercial equivalents were coming online. The US government had actually created a COMSAT. It was a private communication satellite communi com company created by the US government. And that in turn created international partnerships to create something called Intelsat. So their first satellite, Intelsat 1 or Early Bird, was mostly an exact copy of SYNCOM 3 but it was only used for commercial operations. It would be launched in April of 1965 and activated in its final orbit position over the Atlantic in June 28th, 1965. And from that point onwards, there was almost always a 24-hour satellite communication link avail available across the Atlantic. It would provide the first live TV coverage of spacecraft splashdown, Gemini 6. It would operate for like three times longer than it was designed until it was replaced in January of 1969. But when its replacement failed weeks before the Apollo 11 mission, it would be reactivated to help relay the first television signals from the moon to, from the US to Europe. The second generation of Intelsat again followed the same design as SYNCOM 3, but they scaled it up so that it was much bigger, more than twice the mass and capable of much more bandwidth. The plan was to launch three of these and distribute them around the world so that there would be a truly global communications network. Unfortunately, the first one failed to reach its final orbit, so they ended up launching four, but in the end, they got their worldwide network. I think my favourite moment from this era was a special broadcast called Our World and it started as an idea by the BBC to broadcast an event from as many countries as possible to as many countries as possible. And it's particularly notable because towards the end the BBC brought in the Beatles to perform a new song that they had been working on, All You Need Is Love. That was the first time it was broadcast, the first time it was shared to the world via satellite. In the studio, they had all their friends there, the Rolling Stones, Eric Clapton, Marianne Faithful, a live orchestra. It was truly a worldwide event. Our world included contributions from across Europe, the USA, Mexico, Japan, Australia, uh, Africa even. 14 national broadcasters were involved in creating segments and it was shown in 24 countries. It would have been more, but days before the Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Poland and Hungary withdrew for political reasons. And that neatly brings us to the next episode. While the US was revolutionizing communications, what was the Soviet Union doing with communications satellites? I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.